Hey everyone, welcome to our podcast here at the MIT Center for Real Estate. My name is Larry Dang and I'm a current graduate student at the MIT Real Estate Development Program. I'll be your host today. Prior to joining MIT, I had the opportunity to attend the 2024 MIT World Real Estate Forum in the summer. And that's where I met Jor, and he was one of the featured speakers amongst a panel of industry thought leaders and experts tackling on today's problems. Jor is a author and speaker focused on the future of work in cities. He is the author of the award-winning book, Rethinking Real Estate, that accurately predicted the current reshuffle of offices, homes, and cities. Now, many of these predictions, such as the impact of tech on real estate, the sharing economy, and notably remote work or work from home, have become part of our reality today. In this episode, we'll really dive deep into the future of real estate and the role of technology in shaping urban spaces, especially how businesses, investors, and stakeholders can thrive in this new nonlinear world. Drawer's ideas are challenging the status quo and redefining what we think we know about real estate and infrastructure. So without further ado, let's welcome Dror Pollig, our guest to the show. Hi, Larry. Great to be here. And after this introduction, I feel like I can only disappoint people from here on out. <laughs> I hope not, but, but I we'll won't. see. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you here, Dror. Um, let's just jump right in. So sure. I mentioned some of your uh, correct predictions in Rethinking Real Estate that have come into fruition. Now, I hear that you're authoring a new book called After Office, which really focuses on this new concept of a, quote, nonlinear economy. Could you please tell us more about that? Yeah, so one, the name will probably be different. Uh, but essentially, even in, in my first book, which uh, I finished writing a little more than five years ago, so just before COVID, I saw that beyond the, the the daily conversations about, you know, what landlords think and what employees want and what retail customers do, there's kind of deeper trends that are driving a more fundamental shift in, in the relationship between all economic inputs and outputs. So whether it's land, buildings, raw materials, labor, uh, we a lot of our assumptions are, are grounded in the 20th century, this industrial economy where, you know, we take a bunch of stuff, you know, equipment, raw materials, people put it through some sort of meat grinder or machine or corporation and something relatively predictable comes out. Uh, now, of course, it doesn't mean that there's no competition or no mistakes or no surprises. But, you know, when you produce a car or even like a, an annual report at an accounting firm, you kind of know how many people and what kind of materials are required and what's going to come out on the other hand. Uh, what I started seeing is that more and more of our economy starts to behave more like Hollywood or parts of the entertainment industry, where you have much less of an idea of what kind of ingredients are going to produce what kind of value. Sometimes, you know, two people recording, uploading a YouTube video can reach 3 billion people and, and make a lot of money, while someone can invest $300 million in some kind of production that nobody wants to see. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's both that uncertainty, that kind of broken relationship between inputs and outputs. There's also this uncapped upside and downside where, you know, we produce stuff that if it goes well, it suddenly cascades into like huge profits. If it doesn't go well, it's worth nothing. So again, unlike an automobile or something else that even if it's not the best model, you discount it 20% and you kind of clear your inventory or even sell the scraps. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, And I started to notice that. And as we become a bit more like Hollywood, and that's, by the way, that nonlinearity that you mentioned, so that nonlinear relationship between inputs and outputs, so both unpredictable relationship, uh, incommensurate or kind of asymmetrical, and also unstable, meaning that even if you do something, it works great, you try to do the same thing again, it doesn't work. So it's hard to learn both from your failures and from your mistakes. You have to keep experimenting and failing. Uh, now, staying with the Hollywood theme, Hollywood historically embraced all sorts of mitigating strategies to handle this nonlinearity, starting with psychological ones, you know, <laughs> drugs and alcohol to deal with all the failure and uncertainty. But then organizationally, you know, when you see the, the credits rolling at the end of a film, you see that there's like 500 different people that worked on it, sometimes for two years together. Each one belongs to a different organization. Each one lives somewhere else. 
they really brought the exact right person for the exact job and then they let them disperse back and match together again into a different activity. In terms of physical spaces also, they work with either these studio stages that every day can be a completely different place or they have these back lots which are very specialized. Like, you know, if you want like a Brooklyn street or like a desert or something like that, you can find exactly that in the studio but what they don't have is that in between thing that like okay here's the place where we're going to shoot everything and every day is going to look exactly the same and everyone's going to do the same thing and then financially they have completely different approaches which are more similar to venture capital so they assume that most of what they do will fail that a few successes are going to make up for all the failures and they fund every initiative as a separate bet rather than like, again, being like some company that produces stuff every day in the same manner and assumes that, that every day something useful will happen. Now, Hollywood is like that essentially because it depends on intangible assets, on things that, again, that can scale very quickly, that are produced in a nonlinear manner. And what I started to see is that more and more industries are starting to behave in the same way. And then even statistically, you can see that Intangible assets used to be 2 or 3% of GDP, I don't know, 70 years ago. Today, they're closer to 30%, I think, in terms of total investment. And even more pronounced, when you look at the S&P 500, you see that in the 1970s, 90% or 80-something percent of all assets on balance sheets were tangible assets. So again, equipment, actual physical stuff. And today, about 90% are intangible assets, so software, brands, goodwill, organizational kind of know-how. Uh, and the way intangible assets are produced is, is, is non-linear, basically produced in a very different manner. Uh, so to make a long story short, and I'm sure we'll come back to this theme again, I started to see that the basic assumptions that, that kind of undergird office markets in particular, cities more broadly, and even like other institutions, like, you know, our pension funds, our all assumptions about our careers mm -hmm. and how we invest. Uh, basically are no longer valid and that companies will need much more flexibility. They will need to hire from many more locations, whether it means hiring people who work from home or opening more offices in other places. Uh, they will not be able to sign 10-year leases because they themselves will not have any idea what they need or where or, or what people are supposed to do. Uh, and that, that war for talent because fewer people determine more of the revenue or the value uh, is going mm -hmm. to intensify indefinitely, which means when looking at offices, that you're looking at a world where the reduction of total demand, because fewer people can produce more value, redistribution of the remaining demand to more places. And third, even the people who want to pay for offices are becoming more demanding and more fickle at the same time, meaning they want more amenities, they want more whatever it is that can attract employees, and they're not willing to sign a long-term lease or promise you too much, uh, which from a real estate perspective doesn't just mean that you have challenges and you have to learn to do new things, but essentially it means that the nature of your asset is changing, the nature of your cash flow is changing. You're no longer a government bond that just sits somewhere and you know collects a check. But you're an operating business that has to constantly respond to what people want, think about them, more like a hotel or a restaurant or anything else, which is a business that can make money, can make even a lot of money. But it's a very different business from commercial real estate as we all thought of it, you know, up until five years ago. Right, right. This nonlinearity is creating a lot of, uh, you know, pressured uh, flexibility. If you don't change, you're going to be left behind, right? Mm -hmm. And during the, I like what you said about the Hollywood uh, um, economy and, and matching the right person with the right job. Um, it kind of goes back to the World Real Estate Forum when you were describing the Boston Celtics. I think they just won the championship that day. I'm a Nets fan, so I wasn't too happy, but I liked your analogy where, you know, you ask the crowd, Brown, where is he from Atlanta? Al Horford, Dominican Republic. You know, these people are, are not from the Boston area. So like, why would the Celtics, well, imagine if the Celtics just recruited from the Boston area, wouldn't it be a championship yeah. team, wouldn't it be a NVIDIA, right? But my question is like, is since, you know, this non-linearity has opened up the workforce on a global scale, you know, I guess top talent is competing with other top talent across the mm -hmm. country, right? What are the people that are, I guess, not the top talent, what are they, what are they gonna do? So one, I wanna emphasize a couple of points, cause like, why, 
one of the a person in the audience said, oh, okay, yeah, but the Boston Celtics still imagine if they would practice remotely, they wouldn't be a great team. So they still all come together. <laughs> right. That's a good point. But the thing is they get paid $50 million a year. So they're happy to move to wherever the job right. is. But most companies cannot afford to pay what, for you know, to move everyone around whenever they need them. Um, mm -hmm. But the global competition for talent. So one here too, just like Hollywood, the fact that you're a superstar doesn't mean that you can kind of rest on your laurels or that you kind of you're set for life because you still don't know if the next thing you do is going to be successful because it's not very clear to to you why you were successful to begin with uh, so it's still a world with a lot of anxiety and stress uh, in terms of what happens to the rest of us here i have better news <laughs> that you know, when we speak about the best people, it's not necessarily that they have any innate qualities, you know, the tallest, the smartest, uh, the most beautiful. Uh, the best in this economy means someone who fits a specific task perfectly. So it, it's, a more, it's an increasingly specialized economy and it creates opportunities for more and more people to basically do something very specific and find people who will pay for it. Uh, so of course at the top end, but even in the middle, we're seeing more and more specialized services that kind of cross between multiple areas of expertise. So, you know, not just like I'm a software developer, but I'm a software developer that specializes in uh, health and safety in Latin America and, you know, with a specific type of database. Or I'm a dog walker for vegan uh, dogs. You know, you see it in all parts of the economy where things just become more and more specialized and people are willing to right. pay a premium for the exact thing that they want. Uh, like many things, I know this is a clean, family-friendly podcast, but if you look at the adult industry <laughs> online, you see these trends kind of ahead of everywhere else. Like every everything, like, you know, people are paying just to get attention from a different human being with very right. specific characteristics and styles, and they're willing to pay a premium for that and competing with historically offline <laughs> service providers in those fields. Right in ways that would have been hard to imagine again 10 years ago to think that mm. that thing could replace the other thing. But that specialization, the matching that the internet enables creates new forms of value. And I think that that need for matches, for optimized matches is the key driver behind the redistribution of work because companies, again, need to find that right person at the right place. And it doesn't mean the best person in the world. It means the best person for me for this task, which means that there's a lot of people that can match at any given day to whatever is needed. But it also probably means that that match doesn't last forever. So it's not like I'm going to hire you and pay you the best salary for the next 40 years. But it means I need you right now. I'm going to pay you a lot for your time, whether it is for right. a day, for an hour, or even for a year and a half. Again, just like in Hollywood. And then you go and figure out the rest. Uh, you know, find right. your next project. The demand is tense, and intense, and it, but it's not fixed. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. about like the matching and the preferences. Uh, you also, which is very secular, uh, a, a secular trend, and also you know mm -hmm. people leaving offices. Do you think that uh, this is really contributing to the urban and the human doom loop? Um, you mentioned this previously a lot in your uh, posts and uh, in your blog as well. Um, how, how do you feel about where you know I guess human and people are trending towards? Yeah, so now I'm going to give you an even longer answer. I'm I'm, I'm going with the long <laughs> answers today. That's why we're here. <laughs> so, so, you know, when the internet came along, uh, let's say 30 years ago or so, the commercial internet, uh, the first predictions from experts were everyone's going to work remotely, cities are in trouble, offices are in trouble. Uh, famously, The Economist magazine came out with a special called The Death of Distance, and which later became a book. Uh, and predicted that, okay, now goods and ideas can move much more cheaply and quickly. So the kind of agglomerations of the past are going to lose their value. Now, as we know, the 20 years that followed, exactly the opposite happened. So cities became more important economically, jobs and economic activity became more concentrated, not just in cities, but in a smaller number of cities, uh, rents for both offices and apartments, increased dramatically and the, basically all the best companies kind of flowed back into the city from the suburbs uh, mm -hmm. now when economists and urbanists try to explain why that is happening they came up with three reasons which 
all three were wrong in terms of their implications, but they're still very relevant as we think about the future. The first one was that as the economy becomes more dependent on innovation, in-person work becomes more important because that's how you produce ideas at a higher velocity. Like people need to bump into each other and spend time together and also bump into someone else at the bar downstairs from another company and kind of come up with the, the next new idea. The second is the idea of just a lifestyle kind of associated with Richard Florida and the rise of the creative class that like, because the economy is more dependent on very educated and creative people, these people like to live in cities. So cities become more important just because they offer a certain lifestyle that these people like, you know, they like to go to the restaurants and the theater and to be near one another. And the third explanation was that matching theory from uh, Professor Enrico Moretti from UC Berkeley, who basically said that cities have thick labor markets. So in a, in a city, your potential to find the optimal match is higher than anywhere else because you have access to the largest possible labor pool. So just like in dating, if you have very specific requirements of what you're looking for, in a big city, you're much more likely to find that person rather than in a small village. Um, now, all these explanations were correct theoretically, but they assume that cities are going to become more and more dense and more important and that you know remote work is basically not possible. Uh, what they fail to realize is that once technology is good enough, technology itself actually offers solutions for each one of the things that they provide. So in terms of the velocity of interactions, again, you can collaborate and communicate with more people online more quickly than you can even in the largest city. In terms of lifestyle, yes, highly educated and creative people want to live in the best cities because these cities offer great variety. But if you suddenly tell them, actually, you don't even have to be in a city, go live anywhere you want, then suddenly they want even more variety. One of them wants to live near the beach. One of them wants to live in a mountain. One, one of them wants to live in the center of Manhattan. One of them wants to live in Thailand. So once technology enables them to express their, their desire for, for variety and diversity, even further, suddenly the city is not the end of it. The city is just the beginning of it. And third, mm -hmm. in terms of matching, Yes, hiring from a pool of 30 million people, let's say, in the Bay Area or around Manhattan is amazing. But if you can suddenly hire from a pool of 300 million people or 500 million people, that is going to be more attractive for you as an employer. So instead of just restricting yourself to the biggest city on Earth, if you can suddenly be in five cities or you can be anywhere, that is necessarily going to become more attractive. Uh, and that's what I saw kind of coming when I first the first book, when I wrote the first book and what I focused even more on. In the, in the current book, because all of these things are just getting started. So we already kind of grapple with their effects. But uh, a lot of our economy is going to be transformed further over the next 10, 15 years. Right. That makes sense. And you just said we're just getting started. So what asset class, apart from office, uh, do you think, in real estate, do you think is going to be impacted the most um, due to these new shifts and, and these loops? So one, I think all of them will be impacted because, you know, offices determine where people live and where goods move around and where shops open and which cities prosper or don't prosper. So we cannot isolate one or the other. Uh, I think one thing that is happening in all of them is that even if the demand remains, in all of them, we see that growing demand also for flexibility and other layers of basically operational costs of various kinds. So, uh, mm. you know, more services, more fit out, more specialized systems. And you see it even in, in industrial spaces uh, and, and, of course, in apartments and in retail as well. So uh, a lot of the, you know, over the last few years, a lot of investors moved to, to industrial because that was the last thing that still looked like traditional real estate. It's kind of like you're renting these big boxes, you're signing long leases. It kind of behaves a bit more like offices used to behave 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But even in the industrial world, you see the emergence of these operating brands that are not just brands and logos, but that basically specialize, whether it is in cold storage or in data centers or certain types of logistics, and they have their own systems and their own energy system, energy sources and integration with, uh, with logistical uh, networks. So it's mm -hmm. becoming a more and more kind of hands-on specialized operating business. Uh, if you're just offering an empty warehouse, it's harder and harder to make money. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And even that part, like even industrial, which was really hot for the last few years, I think could be disrupted quite easily, you know, whether it is by autonomous vehicles or drones or, or things that suddenly change the way stuff moves around and gets delivered, uh, where it needs to stop, whether it can skip certain stops along the way. Uh, and the crisis in office, for example, also affects that too, because if suddenly you have a lot of empty space in urban areas, a lot of that could be, you know, last mile logistics or energy or server farms. And some people are experimenting with that as well. So suddenly when it's cheap to do that in the center of the city, you say, hey, so I don't need like a, yeah. a warehouse just on the edge of the city before I kind of connect to my last mile deliveries, but I can actually have something or spread it into 10 locations that are smaller in the same city coordinated by software. So it's all gets mm -hmm. shaken up. Right. Sorry. Yeah. It sounds like uh, these cities that people are moving out of with, with high, you know, uh, amounts of office, they're they're going to suffer. How will they maintain, you know, their existing infrastructure, public services, et cetera? And moreover, how do they bring those people back to the cities as people move to more, I guess, decentralized suburban or rural rural locations? Yeah. So one, I think for many many cities, and I think Boston is one of them, rely quite heavily on commercial property. Uh, and what they'll have to do is one. <laughs> cut costs and behave a little more responsibly. Second, they'll have to encourage conversion where possible, but in many cases or in most cases, it will not be possible. Uh, so third, they'll have to embrace other things that people want to do in cities that can generate revenue and, and bring people back, uh, which means more housing, more retail, more entertainment, more history, more culture. Mm -hmm. uh, to do that, you have to actually spend money, probably, both for the developers that convert things and for the cities that have to make a lot of their infrastructure and experiences even better while they are getting less revenue uh, because of the office crisis. But I think that's the correct thing to do. I mean, your mm -hmm. cities should double down on whatever only cities can do, which, again, offering a healthy, walkable, dense, right. diverse uh, environment offering access to great public goods, you know, whether it's parks or schools or healthcare or everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and like in the essence, cities are machines to reduce transaction costs. They enable people to experiment more quickly, to try stuff, to contract with each other without having to move across the country or to, you know, hire someone fully. And historically, before cities became so ossified under the kind of current industrial paradigm, places like Boston or London or New York, coffee shops and these type of kind of liminal proto co-working spaces played a very big part in the economy. You know, the New York Stock Exchange was founded in a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. The first uh, global insurance and financial firm was founded in a coffee shop because there were places that kind of allowed people to come and work and be together without having too much overhead, without fixed costs, without knowing too much about the future. And then once they had a clear idea of where the world is headed, they could go and, and build buildings specifically for that and move their houses to those right. places. Right. So I think cities need to, to enable more of that flexibility and experimentation. Um, right. Got it. Yeah. Um, well, real estate is obviously a very notoriously slow moving sector. Yeah. It goes through infrastructure. <laughs> so flexibility would honestly be amazing. I know you're from New York. I, I've been in New York for the past five years and if Boston could, uh, you know, change up the traffic to relate to New York and like be a little more food with the subway system. That'd be awesome. I know you've been in a lot of cities such as Tel Aviv, Beijing, um, New York, Boston, which is your favorite and why? And where do you, and how do you see your city changing with, you know, I guess these trends that you mentioned? Yeah. So I'll, I'll mention two favorites. One is Tokyo, uh, which it's, it's amazing because it works. You have like a metropolitan of 30 million people. An incredibly well integrated public transport of all levels. So underground, above ground, buses, bicycles, even cars, and multiple different networks and companies operating all of these. And it all works together and enables tens of millions of people to basically be safe and get along with each other <laughs> and to reach <laughs> different parts of that metropolis relatively quickly, uh, which is amazing. It's also even though it's been there for a while, I think it, it offers 
kind of a, a roadmap or a playbook to what the kind of balance between what has to be stable and predicted in advance and what has to be left to grow more organically. So in, in Tokyo, you have that kind of incredible infrastructure, but between the infrastructure in the city blocks themselves, there's incredible freedom. So you can mix almost any use that you like. You can build almost whatever you want by right. And it doesn't mean that you can do anything. You, you know, you can't make noise or pollute or do certain things. They, they govern that. But in terms of mixing whatever happens within those buildings and what kind of retailers or activities are allowed to be in what floor and what type of neighborhood, it's very, very loose. And it gives rise to like a very lively kind of city where a lot of types of very specialized businesses can exist and people can try different things. Um, and I think that's, it's a bit like an Excel sheet, you know, somebody designed it, it's a very powerful machine, but then with every, you can kind of bring whatever you want into it and kind of leverage that power to mix and match whatever you want to put in those, <laughs> in those cells. And, uh, and, and again, and use the kind of the power of the machine to, to do more with whatever you put in. Uh, and I think that's the kind of approach that, that other cities will probably have to embrace. My other favorite is London which has a lot of those good things as well. It's a little less flexible, definitely not as flexible as London, but has great public transport, uh, great bus lanes, particularly over the last decade, really built an incredible cycling infrastructure. But I particularly like it because it's a truly global city. Like in New York, we like to think that it's a global city, and it is, it's, it's more important than London. But New York is still very, fo very focused on itself and on the rest of the US because it's at the center of the largest economy in the world. In London, because it's not at the center, it feels more like it's facing outwards all the time. And it has a lot of interesting people and it's focused on a lot of stuff that happens around it, which just personally, I just love, you know, I spend time there, I always meet interesting mm -hmm. people and I feel like enriched. Uh, in New York, everyone is busy and just wants to make money and, and run. So uh, <laughs> in London, it feels like the, the pace is a little slower and maybe they pay the price for it, but at least it's enjoyable. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, let's take a pivot into the, uh, I guess, the future seeing side of investment and development strategies. And I'd like to start to hear your opinion on the most recent uh, Fed rate cut of 50 basis yeah. points. Uh, do you think that, you know, um, this is going to influence investor behavior? Or And I want to hear how you are interpreting uh, the Fed. I guess, prediction of future economic distress. Do you think they mm -hmm. also see the urban or human doom loop? Have you consulted with the Fed? Is that, is that why they cut the basis points? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think they definitely see that, you know, there's mixed signals in the economy. And I think part of that is that nonlinearity that we started with, you know, we are during a, we are during a tech boom and tech companies are cutting headcount aggressively. And the offices of these tech companies are half empty. This is very unusual. You know, during the dot-com boom, tech mm -hmm. companies were not cutting tens of thousands of employees mm -hmm. every day. And landlords were basically taking stock options from tenants in order to give them space because there wasn't enough space, even in Boston and, and in New York and, and definitely in San Francisco. Uh, so the Fed sees this kind of, I, I wrote about that, like the kind of Schrodinger's economy, you know, on the one hand, the kind of headline Macro data seems to be saying that things are okay, but on the ground, there's a lot of details that kind of, you know, a lot of red lights are signaling. Uh, at the same time, we also know that inflation, even though it's slowed down, it's still a big burden for a lot of people. And most Americans are just not happy with the state of the economy, not just because of the actual state, but because of their projections for the future. They, they kind of feel that their jobs are unstable. Uh, the things are changing too quickly and, and they basically don't feel comfortable economically. Uh, so the Fed was responding to that. I think in terms of real estate and cities specifically, my main concern with the rate cut is that it's going to prolong the denial uh, and kind of blunt the urgency of taking action, both for cities in terms of adapting more aggressively to a kind of post office world. And by post office, I don't mean no more offices, but I mean a world where offices are less central and office traffic is less kind of dominant. Uh, so, you know, if the, the retail crisis of the previous decade was only resolved during COVID when a big crisis really forced a lot of landlords to let go of their buildings, to cut rents mm -hmm. or to convert them to other uses, I feel like 
the office crisis will not resolve until there's enough pressure. And I feel like interest rates reduce that pressure, but reducing them even to zero is not going to bring people back to the office or make the value, those, those assets economically right. viable. So it's just going to allow them to kind of survive for a few more years rather than kind of uh, embrace other, try, to, try other things. And again, in terms of conversions, another thing that doesn't necessarily mean becoming apartments. There's a lot of office adjacent uses that can that can still happen within office buildings, whether it's education or healthcare or, or again, different types of data or energy or logistics. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can pick up some of the slack. But in order to do that, you often need zoning changes, planning changes. Right. You need the landlords themselves to kind of try stuff and, and be open minded. Uh, so I don't I don't see interest rates as good news for real estate right from a strategic level of course in the like very narrow sense it's it's better to pay less on your mortgages and your debt than yeah. than what you paid before and uh, and it allows some projects to suddenly pencil that maybe didn't pencil a few months ago assuming they keep right. cutting of course yeah. that's a good point i think i think real estate like is ironically now not as predictable or stable as it once was you said that like things change and things need to be flexible do you recommend any regulation changes because the you know title processes and like getting zoning changes like it's it's a very cumbersome task yeah yeah i think we need to loosen zoning and planning and probably change the whole approach uh, so i'm not saying don't regulate, mm-hmm. but regulate maybe based on impact, you know, noise, pollution, certain things that basically the externalities, but don't tell people what they're they're supposed to do or not do uh, with their mm-hmm. buildings, uh, both for the landlords and again, for businesses as well, like in terms of what people can build in the city and try to do as long as, again, they don't make it dirty or, or mm-hmm. pollute it or attract, uh, you know, uh, a criminal activity. Uh, second, even the existing stuff regulation that we have and that should remain just to streamline it and simplify it because the it just injects unnecessarily cost and time and uncertainty into an environment that already has enough cost and time and you know it doesn't have time <laughs> right. and has enough uncertainty on its own so you know even just like a lot of office conversions would have happened if investors would have known that you know i'll just take this building and in a year and a half i can have something else here but if you know that it might take seven years or 15 years or you don't even know how long it would take, you'd just rather not do it at all. Uh, and, and the same goes for the lenders that finance those buildings. Uh, and the mirror image of it, I think, outside of cities in the suburbs also, we need to have more density. We need to allow more commercial construction uh, because people want to work near their homes and they want to shop near their homes. Uh, and... Um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, the solutions are, you know, are not very complicated. They're very complicated to implement and very hard to implement. But in terms right. of what needs to be done, it's not, it's pretty simple. Like, let people build more, let them experiment, yeah. and, uh, and and basically let the physical world adapt to the changes that already happened in the actual economy. Yeah, makes sense. And I know, like, um, you know, you've also consulted um, in private equity and tech, like, you know, big banks, institutional pension, uh, pension funds, et cetera. Uh, but you personally, have you applied any of your theory into more, you know, practical, like investment strategies, like anything on your balance sheet you pay to share? Yeah, sure. So I, uh, starting from the personal basis, even just talking about real estate, you know, I, I had to, I started a family a few years ago, just before COVID, and I had to decide where where to buy a house, you know, beyond my investments and other things. Uh, and I chose a place that is just on the edge of New York City, but it, it's kind of like a very dense suburb, basically, which mm-hmm. has a 35 minute train to the center of Manhattan. So I get to the center of Manhattan faster than a lot of people in Brooklyn and, and Queens do. It's in a spot where if Manhattan does very well, my property values go up. And if my, even if everyone runs away from Manhattan, I'm the first place where they'll come to buy a house. So it's kind of like a nice hedge uh, in that sense. And ultimately, and I bought this house, like literally my wife sent me the listing. I looked at the map because I know how to read one and I just told her to buy the house. Because I saw that it's near a train station. It's near a, a kind of a main street with restaurants and, and, and lifestyle stuff. It's near mm. 
the water so I can walk to the water. It has sidewalks, which is very important to me mm. and there's not enough of in American suburbs. So I kind of looked right. at really at real estate fundamentals and I said, even if I don't know anything else about what will happen, this will always be valuable because, right. you know, again, there's, there's nature, there's water, there's public transport, there's commercial activity. That's it. So that's in terms of like my, my personal real estate. In terms of investing in other real estate, my main position over the last five years was not to touch it at all. So <laughs> that was my position <laughs> to invest in tech <laughs> and in crypto <laughs> and in gold. And in crypto. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, so you went <laughs> my, my nonlinear, my nonlinear approach is that on the one hand, I'm extremely conservative in a way that enables me to constantly make more bets and experiment and try stuff and not get locked into any path. So, you know, I live in a house that is much cheaper than what I could afford. I have a very low mortgage. I, I have very little debt. I'm very conservative on certain sides. But then 10, 15% yeah. of my investments, I invest in really crazy stuff. So again, whether it's crypto or like NVIDIA and things like that, which are now kind of very common, but back, you know, three, four years ago when I started investing in them seemed like more speculative. So mm -hmm. stuff that, and of course I invest in venture capital and, and you know, I, both angel investments and the natural fund. Like I like to have stuff that can go up 100X in value or 1,000X in value. And mm -hmm. for me, just the possibility is kind of, virtuous in itself so i don't care if crypto is stupid or doesn't make sense the fact that it's an asset that can go up 100x in value and has shown the ability to do that makes it relevant for my portfolio for a few percentage points because if i just again like in the 1950s if i just invest in the s p or just do value investment i'm probably not going to catch up with inflation enough to to have the kind of retirement that my parents or grandparents uh, were able to have by following the exact same strategy. So I'm actually combining extreme conservatism with extreme risk taking, but with very little aiming for the middle. And and maybe I'm wrong. Balance in life. Let's, <laughs> let's check in in thirty years. <laughs> well, what would you tell a pension fund with a with long term holds in you know I guess suburban office and such like how should someone position themselves to get into real estate now um with you know like you said it's, it, there's there's that that inability to plan anything right yeah so i think pension funds already moved uh more into you know again venture capital private equity like hands-on operational stuff uh the best among them partner with operators that can de-risk those assets. So again, starting with hotel, then to retail, then to multifamily and office. So partnering with with operators and even investing in these type of operators is, is something that the best pension funds are already doing. And I think this is the key. You know, real estate is not going to disappear. We will still need physical space to do a lot of the stuff that we do. The only issue is you will need these extra operational layers to ensure that people come back every day to your specific building rather than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And if you do it well, you're going to make more money than ever before out of those buildings mm -hmm. because people are going to pay you for the flexibility, for the services, for all those intangible things, which if you get them right, are much cheaper to produce than you know building another building or adding more marble mm -hmm. to your lobby or, or adding five elevators. Uh, so just like we saw in the hotel world, we're going to see that this emergence of operators that are worth $50 billion or $100 billion like Marriott, even though they hardly own any physical assets. So they bring, again, the brand, the operational expertise, uh, the network of locations and the, the connectivity that, that creates synergies. Uh, and we'll see more of that in, in office and in multifamily. Uh, we saw some early examples of this, you know, with WeWork, for example, but some of them kind of crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. We don't have, unlike in hotels, we don't have the kind of clear operating standards yet in offices or funding standards. You know, we know right. how to finance a hotel and how to operate it, even though at its core, it's more risky than an office building or in a, a multifamily mm -hmm. building. But in multifamily and office, we still haven't figured out the exact right models. But I think both the co-living mm -hmm. and co-working companies have tried a lot of things that gradually standards will emerge from. And, you know, in 10 years, I think it'll be very common to have these kind of branded operators and by brand that I mean like consumer brand, not just, you know, uh, the Avalon Bays or the Blackstones or, you know, the great, right. like 
brands that actually cater to specific types of people and that promise something specific and they're able to extract a premium for people who are willing to pay again that matching pay for that exact thing for you know a, a building right. for people with pets that like to ride peloton and uh, i don't know what and grow apples on their roof like uh, as specific as that so we'll just see more and more specialization there as well Mm-hmm. Right, specialization, and and speaking of specialization, you also mentioned tech. Um, I'm not going to open this can of worms fully, but the term AI. I love worms. A lot. <laughs> you love worms, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, the term AI, right? How did, how is that affecting real estate? And not and like, is it creating more price transparency in a very private, uh, you know, transaction space? Or what do you, what, what yeah. do you think is the biggest impact directly to real estate, rather than you know? creating or disassimilating jobs? Yeah, so, so I think, despite your question, the biggest impact of technology in real estate will not be what it does in real estate. It will be what it does to real estate. So again, in terms of shifting demand, moving people around, yeah. reducing the number of people required, mm-hmm. uh, changing the distribution of income in the economy. Uh, I think this will be the biggest impact. For real estate itself, I think the, the 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 good news is that there's so many low hanging fruits that you can already solve, with even before you get to AI, just with software, you know, streamlining different processes, offering better interfaces for our customers to make stuff easy for them. Uh, you know, when you buy a Tesla today, you have an amazing experience. You literally buy a car from the app. You sort out the financing. You 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 do everything just from the app. Uh, in real estate, we haven't reached that level of, of experience yet for a lot of processes. Even though the technology is there and even the, even the regulation and the legal framework is caught up, like you're allowed to do all sorts of things remotely and sign stuff and verify stuff. Uh, but it's still hard for, for the industry to adopt it. Um, then in terms of AI, I think even for real estate and even for the economy as a whole, part of what will happen is that Nonlinearity and uncertainty will increase, and at the same time, we'll have better and better computers and algorithms that actually allow us to make better predictions and process more data. So it will be a constant kind of race between kind of like complexity and and control. Uh, so I'm not sure who will be ahead at any given moment, but it means that you at least have to participate in the race. That you have to like start taking seriously. Right. whatever is available there and try to embrace as many tools as possible and to hire people who can use those tools to even have a chance to survive. So again, like, to even be in the race, I don't know who will win, but like you want to at least be in the game. Um, and uh, yeah, so it brings it brings the, the opportunity to, to cut some costs. I think the core costs in real estate are still very much, you know, it's, it's hard for technology to affect them. Like it's just in the land price, mm-hmm. In, in the length of time that it takes to bring projects to market. Uh, like you see it in the housing market, you know, there, there's been experiments with uh, with modular construction and kind of prefabricated housing. With moderate success, definitely not kind of overwhelming and not something that was embraced uh, for the whole country. But what you see in a lot of these spaces that even if you get the house itself for like 80% less cost, the whole project ends up costing only 20% less because there's so many other things that, that impact uh, actual oh. prices. Uh, so I don't see a dramatic reduction in costs from AI for real estate. Mm-hmm. I do see yeah. an opening up of new revenue channels. You know, you can collect more data, you can offer better experiences. You can do all sorts of new things maybe uh, that people will pay for. But again, that requires having a point of view, taking a risk, building something, building operational capabilities that may prove to be very successful or may not, uh, just like in retail, in, in hotels. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And uh, I think a lot of things you made uh, you said made sense retrospectively. However, I'm wondering, you know, when you were doing your research for the nonlinear economy and even maybe for rethinking real estate, was there like a trend or an insight that you did not anticipate at all? when you're researching it, like a Eureka moment? I think, I don't know if it's about not anticipating, but I think it's it's a relevant trend. One of the drivers of all the things we described is is, is abundance. You know, people suddenly have a lot of choice. They have a lot of options. Everything's mm-hmm. available off the shelf. So both for buildings and for almost everything else we consume, suddenly the brand and the story and the experience and the kind of social connection of it becomes so much more important. 
So what I see is that when certain things become suddenly more ab- abundant, other things become more scarce and open up mm-hmm. new opportunity. And if you look at our world, what is becoming more scarce? So physical interaction, health and movement. Uh, I mean, there's more inequality. There's a scarcity of good investment, <laughs> of solid and safe investments. <laughs> Right. There's kind of a variety of things that suddenly become more rare, and all of them are tied to real estate in one way or another. Real estate is in a position to impact them, to solve them. So again, creating communities that allow people to interact more or to be more healthy or building brands and operating platforms that help to risk uh, assets that are already very favored by large institutional investors. Uh, even in terms of reducing inequality and polarization, a lot of that is basically because of the failure of the physical world to adapt. I think a lot of people have a feeling that we're in this kind of zero sum game where if some people benefit, it means I'm I'm probably losing out. And mm. a key reason why it is a zero sum game often is because the built world doesn't adapt to the changes in the economy. It's easier to see in terms of housing. So you know you have a city, it's prosperous. More people want to move there. The people that live there say, no, 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 no. We don't want more housing here. So you basically mean whoever is already here is going to benefit from everything the city offers. Their property will increase in value and everyone else can just fall behind Mm -hmm. and have access to fewer opportunities, not get on board. Uh, But but it's true in, in, in other parts of the built world as well. But basically, if we make it more adaptive, I think it will help the economy kind of spread its fruits a little better. And uh even if the economy itself is becoming inherently more unequal, which I think it is because nonlinear production produces inequality kind of on its own, mm-hmm. unlike industrial production, which needs a lot of people who are kind of similar, earn the same thing, have the same education, do the same stuff. We're moving to an economy that is built differently. But even then, if you assume that we have to change the taxation and then kind of the benefits that we provide to people and kind of public spending, it's much more efficient to do that in an urban environment. You know, if you open great schools and great parks and you want to offer people free everything, let's say, it's much more feasible to do that in a city rather than to try to deliver it to every suburban home. Uh, But if you're in a city and there's density, you can really give people access to the best quality stuff uh, funded by taxes from those amazing achievements of, you know, a few of us, but the same few that constantly change as well. So it's not like each of us will contribute something useful at some point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Constant change, flexibility, uh, you know, can't really plan much. I worry for our young professional uh, slash students. Um, they're in our audience. So do you have any advice for these people that, you know, are prepared for career, whether in real estate or adjacent yeah. in this increasingly non-linear world? Listen to a lot of podcasts. And this one uh, specifically, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's only it's only half a joke. I think, you know, we have to stay very, very curious to stay very, very open minded uh, to take more risk. And again, taking more risk doesn't mean like, just you know, being stupid about it. It means that you can be more conservative on, on certain parts of your life, just like what I described, to give yourself room to, to, you know, to take multiple swings, basically, and to assume that this is what life will be about, that you'll have to try 10, 20 different things mm-hmm. over the next 20 years. and psychologically to know that it's okay to fail it's cool to try it's fine and you know be generous with yourself and with people around you and encourage each other and also just financially be ready for that so assume that you know save what you can and at the same time take risk don't try to do that middle thing of like i'm just going to follow some kind of clear predictable path because that path probably doesn't lead to where you think it leads because we're not Mm -hmm. in the 1950s or even in the 1980s anymore Uh, so i think stay curious Try to mix different interests in the way that makes you unique. So both like hard skills, you know, whatever you're studying, finance or accounting or engineering or history, but mix that with other things that's going to give you a little twist. And because matching is at the heart of all of Mm -hmm. this value creation, make it easier for the world to match you with whatever opportunity is best for you. Now, it doesn't mean you have to upload TikToks all day, but you have to to do stuff (laughs) that makes it easy for people who want to find you to find you. Uh, Again, it doesn't mean you have to become a superstar, but you have to have one, like to hold a flag, just to say, hey, I'm this and that. Like, I'm interested in this. I'm interested in that. And put stuff out there 
whether it's academic articles or go to events or post stuff or write. But there, there's, for whatever it is that you're interested in, there's a market for that on earth at the moment. You know, people make money from writing newsletters about donuts. You know, yeah. <laughs> you can make money from anything, but you yeah. have to, to express yourself and, and to be special, but again, not special. Like you don't have to be Taylor Swift. You just, whatever actually interests you, you should do more of that and right. balance it with other practical skills. Because another thing, I think even for your own well-being, to go through this kind of Hollywood-like journey, the people who succeed in Hollywood are people who really, really want to succeed in Hollywood and are willing to go through a lot of stuff. So they're doing something that they love. And I think more of us will have to do that in order to survive mm -hmm. our careers. Because if you pay the price that we're all going to pay anyway for something that you're not so excited about, it's going to break you along the way. Uh, the good news, the upside is that there are opportunities in almost again, in any direction, whatever it is that interests you, there's a way to make a living from it. And there's a lot of people out there that are interested in it that you can match with. Uh, so make the most of it. Yeah. Thank you so much for that insight and wisdom, Jorah. Can't wait to read more about it also in your new book. Uh, hopefully get a signed copy at the center of real estate. That'd be great. <laughs> but all joking aside. Thanks so much for joining us and you know sharing your insights on the non-linear economy, you know its impact on real estate. You know I think it's very clear that flexibility and adaptability will be very key as tech continues to you know shape and reshape our cities. Thank you for having me and uh, go Celtics. Yes, thank you so much. To our listeners, thank you for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hopefully you're walking away with a new and fresh perspective on the opportunities and challenges we are currently facing in real estate. Now, if you haven't already, I highly recommend checking out Jor's book. It's called Rethinking Real Estate, as well as anticipating for his new untitled upcoming work. And that promises to even further challenge conventional thinking and help us prepare for what ultimately lies ahead. As always, we thank you so much for tuning in to the MIT Center for Real Estate podcast. We'll be back with more discussions on the future of real estate, urban planning, and investment trends with movers and shakers in private equity, development, tech, and sustainability. Until then, stay curious, stay innovative, like, follow, share, subscribe, and maybe keep an eye on how technology and the economy continue to reshape our world. My name is Larry Dang, and we'll see you next time.